Thank you, Father God, that you see to it, Lord, that we could not even do it, Lord, though we are conforming your words already. So you have given us the Holy Spirit to guide us, to lead us to rebuke us, to exhort us, and to teach us accordingly as you intended it to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, those who are here. Tonight, another night, another study of the Word of God. Some of you may have already... Uh, know some of this teaching or these doctrines but it's always good to to, re, to get reinforcement to realize that you are not alone in what you have believed in that God is working in the hearts of men individually so that corporately we can all be gathered together under his banner the blood stained banner of Jesus Christ tonight is the sixth night that we're going to be together. We have come now to the second half of Ephesians 3, verses 13 to 21. We have already seen that the whole plan of salvation was fulfilled in the holy history of our Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine that. Our history is fulfilled in Christ. In the first two chapters of this epistle, Paul expounds the truth as it is in Christ. Everything that we'll ever have, we'll ever get, is in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? He revealed to us the matchless charms of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which redemption, full and complete, how is it? Full and complete has been obtained for all mankind. And that was in our last study. All mankind, in verses 1 to 12. We saw that this wonderful gift of salvation includes the Gentile world. We should rejoice because we are the Gentile world. You know, in the painting of the Jewish uh, economy, we are the Gentile. There is no bloodlines within us. Although they misrepresented it, they misunderstood the gent what the Gentile means when God told him to. Okay? Now, this is the divine mystery that it seems and was kept suppressed. It seems it was kept suppressed in the past, but since the New Testament period has been revealed prominently, first Peter, and then especially through Paul, that the Gentiles were included in the plan of salvation all along. God's desire is for all. Tonight, we are coming to an extremely important section of these epistles in Ephesians 3, 30 to 21, and we need to be rooted and grounded in love because every Christian are expected and needed to stand against the fiery darts or the wily fiery darts of Satan to stand the pressures of this sinful world. You know, there's a lot of pressure that comes within us. Now, we do not know sometimes where it came from and how did it came about. Remember, we have an enemy and he is roaring like a lion, seeketh about whom he may devour. Now, there are two important facts that the New Testament brings out concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ that every Christian must be absolutely clear. We need to be clear about this. The first truth is the love of God. Why? Because the ground of our salvation is not our performance. What is it? Not our performance nor our goodness. Then what it is? It is the unconditional, self-emptying love of God. We are saved because God loves us. Jesus made it crystal clear in John 3.16. Let me read it in your hearing. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have, but have eternal life. Eternal life. That is, John says that, and it was Christ who said it in the book of John. Now, Paul made it known also in Romans 5 that the love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And then he expounds that love. He expounds it. He could not help it, but expound it in Romans 5, verse 5 to 8. And this is what it says. Romans 5, 5 to 8. Uh, you can get your Bible. Uh, don't just listen to what I said. Read it yourself in the Bible also. 
And so that together, it does not matter what translations you have, read it. And all of us can be blessed together. And it says, And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That word poured out means overflow. It overflowed towards us. Whom He has given us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, that's impotent. Greek, impotent. That means you cannot do anything. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That pronoun us, remember? Us means all. Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles. Yes. So while we were helpless, ungodly, enemies and still sinners, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. By doing this, He demonstrated His love towards us. Imagine that. While we were all that, full of negativity, what did God do? He demonstrated His love towards us. Look at Titus. 3. Titus 3 verse 5. Okay? It's at the back of your Bible. Find it there. <clears throat> Next to Timothy. First, second, Thessalonians, and then Timothy, and then second Timothy, and then Titus. That's where you find it. It says in Titus 3 5. He saved us. Listen to this. He saved us not because of righteous things we have done but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. What does Titus 3.5 says? He saved us not because of what? Of righteous things we have done, but because of His what? Of His mercy. He saved us through the washing. And how did He do it? Washing of rebirth. And renewal by the Holy Spirit. That is redundant. That words in there are redundant. Washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit is the same word. Born again. Okay? So the love of God is the ground of our salvation. And every believer needs to know this. That our salvation is not because of works that we have done. Or the righteous things we have done. Because in the eyes of God, it is but filthiness. Now, the fact that God loves us unconditionally is not enough to save us. So this love of God is not able to save us because our God is a holy God. He is a righteous God. He is a just God. He cannot save us, redeem us, or take us to heaven simply by excusing our sins. He has to dealt with it. If he don't dealt with it accordingly, the will that would make him an unjust God, wouldn't he? Say, God, you did it because you just hocus focus it. That's what happened. You just hocus focus it. So God must do it legally. Now, his law makes it clear. The soul that sins, it must die in Ezekiel 11 or 18. The soul that sins, it must die. You cannot transfer sin from father to son, son to father, mothers, to anyone. You're the one who committed it. You must pay for it. So how can he pay for my sin? How can he pay for your sin? How can he redeem you? The second truth that every Christian must know is the in Christ idea. Okay? That is the central theme of Paul's theology, in Christ's idea or in Christ's motif. This is what we saw in Ephesians 1, chapter 1 and 2. God took you, He took me, He took all mankind and put us into Christ at the incarnation. And it qualified, that is the key word, it qualified Christ to be our Savior, representative and our substitute. But, and it is called incarnation. But this incarnation did not save us. 
what this what did this do it qualified him to be what to be our savior to be our representative to be our substitute then by his perfect life which meet the positive demands of the law and by his sacrificial death which meet the justice of the law god gave mankind a new history a new status in which we stand justified this is the good news of the gospel we are justified this is what jesus commissioned his disciples to preach into all the world this is the mystery of salvation which includes the gentile world humanity is involved in it but all this was made possible because of god's love not because of your goodness not because of your righteousness but what but because of god's love that's what makes it possible and this is what paul is dealing with in ephesians 3 13 to 21. to appreciate this passage we must keep in mind the context the historical context of this episode remember where is paul on this time where was he when he was writing this letter or epistles to the ephesians where is he prison yes he was in prison yes, in a roman dungeon why was he there why was he in prison uh, because he was preaching the gospel he was preaching the gospel have you think of that that wouldn't you think that it's possible that when you're sharing the gospel you could end up in prison or this story is just only back then this is only applicable for paul do you think this could happen today or tomorrow yes it could happen <laughs> But what have you done? You're preaching good, good news. You're preaching things that can help the people. So Paul was in prison in a Roman dungeon for preaching the gospel to the Gentile world. Was he, was he put there because he was preaching the gospel only or because he was preaching to the people that other people thought that they're not you know, deserving? They're not deserving. Those are part of it, right? While at it, he had received news that his flock, especially at Ephesus, had become very discouraged. Why were they discouraged? This is the reason. If God, this is the thinking of the Ephesians, if God, the supreme God that Paul proclaimed to them, is not able to protect Paul, who is now languishing in a Roman prison, what hope is there for us? Paul is in prison. And he served a recent God. But yet he is there. What hope is it for us? And their faith began to dwindle. Hearing it, Paul write this letter of encouragement. He said, in Christ, you have salvation full and complete. You should not be worried nor be discouraged. Why not? Why not, Paul? So this is what he said. He unpacked this love of God in Ephesians 3. 30 to 21. Can somebody read Ephesians 3, 30 to 21? Ephesians 3, 30 to 21. Volunteer. I can read. Go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Sister Nita. Welcome. Good evening, Hi, Sister Nita. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> so, what it was, 13, right, you said? Yeah, 13 to 21. Okay. okay. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged, discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. Okay. A prayer for the Ephesians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, 
so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the sin to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the full fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurable more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him he to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you for reading. What is going on here? Verse 13. Hmm? <clears throat> Isn't a tremendous passage in there? Yeah, complete, right? But what Paul is saying in it, what was he saying? Huh? So this is why he is writing about the love of God. They are losing heart because of his imprisonment. He was in jail. This is what's going on. We are all in jail. So we need, we are discouraged. And Paul got a hold of it, got here of it. So what did Paul do? First of all, in verse 13, Paul is writing to a group of discouraged believers, as you know, as it is written. And they were discouraged because Paul was in prison and they were beginning to undermine the protective power of God. Paul is saying, no, don't you ever get discouraged because of me. I am exactly where I am because God desired me to be here. <laughs> Amen. Think of that. The when trial comes into our situation, do we say the same thing? Do we say to people like, oh, I feel sorry for you? Do we go to God, Lord, thank you for the position that you have put me where exactly I am here? Do we say those things? But that's what Paul's saying. I am exactly where I am because God desired me to be here. Paul understood. Paul understood that when you're a Christian, we have an enemy, and that enemy clings within us. And the Lord has to put us into a grind so that our confidence no longer be in our righteousness or in our good works, but that we would wholly lean on Jesus' name. That's what he said. You see, Paul has a heart of a pastor also. Because of the discouragement of his flock, he knows exactly what to do. And what did he do? And where did he go? Huh? He saw the terrible position that they are in. They were sad. Because he's a pastor also, not only a theologian. He knows exactly where to go and what to do. And what did he do? In verse 14, I bow down my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brethren, when you are in the bind, or when somebody comes to you that they are in a bind, who do you call first? Who do you go to the first? Do you run to your, you know, to your phone? And do you dial your best friend? Who do you call? And you say, well, Mark, you know, Paul can't really run to no one because he's in jail. But Paul knows exactly what to do and where to go. And he bowed down his what? I bow down my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now keep in mind that in the days of Paul, you know, the idea back then that if you want to pray God is just to stand up and raise your hands and look unto heaven and to pray. Remember, the, there was a Pharisee and the, uh, and the tax collector that was praying in the church. So the Pharisee was raising his hands and looking up and praying to, praying to himself. But Paul did not do that. You see, when there is deep concern, 
he would go on to his knees. Paul is on his knees because he is deeply concerned about his flocks that are discouraged. So are we also. We need to exercise this. That whatever is going on in our lives, that we need to learn to be thankful to God. In our knees. Pray and call upon Him. Pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And then verse 15. From whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. What does that mean? You see, God is the creator God. He created every being, angels or humans, and the things that we do not even know that existed. We all belong to the family of God by creation. This is the true God that Paul is addressing, the God of heaven, the God of creation. Do you know that? Do you worship him because he is the one who created us? That is our God that we worship. He is the creator God. Mm -hmm. Verse 16. Do you have any comments before I proceed? Statement? Question? Verse 16. It says, he's praying now. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. You see that word you again in there? That is us or any discouraged believers with power through his spirit in your inner being. So Paul was praying for those that has hear his word, that has read the letters, but also he is praying for you and for me. Are you discouraged? Is your heart broken? Are you going through some hard time in life? Someone is praying for you. And Jesus also was praying for you even before you were born. Now, there's a phrase in there at the end of it that says inner being. What does that mean? Or inner man. Now that Expression that is what they call Pauline expression. If you hear that, it's 99.9% .9 that it is Paul that is saying it. When you have inner being or inner man. What does Paul mean by that? Does Paul mean that I want you to be strengthened with great might by his spirit in the inner being? Now, the term inner being is used only for the converted born again Christians. If you are not born again, there is no such thing as inner being. Although there is a thinking, you know, the soul, you know, the, there is in our, in, our, in our head, there is what they call brain. And in the brain, there is the, uh, you know, the, there, everything goes in our body. Everything that happens within us, in our character, uh, the way that we live, the way that we think, the way that we meditate, it's in there. But before we proceed in that, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.16. 2 Corinthians 4.16. It says, 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. You see in the word there? Inwardly, inner being, okay? Or inner man. Also in Romans 7.22. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Remember, there's also a verse that you write the law in where? In my heart. Now, the heart is not the organ, okay? It's not the organ. It's the thinking mind. It's the thinking mind. So, these are Pauline expressions for the converted person. Paul says in Ephesians 2.3 that while we were unconverted, what is going on with our flesh and with our mind when we are not converted? You know what happened with our flesh and our mind when we are not converted? They're in harmony. Okay? They're friends. Whatever wants, the other one goes. Now, in our unconverted minds, we serve the sinful desires of the flesh and of the mind. 
the unconverted man has no contradiction between his sinful nature and his mind. They are in harmony, singing the same tune. Okay? It says in Ephesians 2 verse 3, Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. See that? That's what it says. But something happens. The word of God came. You, you heard it. You weighed into the balance. And you were convicted. You were converted. And you accepted and believed in Jesus Christ. That's what happened. But when you accept Christ, a change takes place where? In your nature or in your mind? When a person is converted, the mind, the will, turns toward God in appreciation and gratitude and accept. What do you accept? The gift of God. And who is the gift of God? Jesus Christ. As what? As your personal Savior. See that? But the sinful nature, what happened to the sinful nature? Does it change? No. The sinful nature has not changed an iota. So that the sinful nature of an unbeliever and the sinful nature of their believer are identical. There's only difference. The difference between the believer and the unbeliever is not the nature but the mind. Your mind. Now there is a constant war within you now. Because the flesh wants to do something but the mind is a thinking mind. A mind that has appreciate what God has done. It says, no, I'm not going to participate on that no more. Why? The reason that you have is because God is not glorified. That is your reason now. You no longer reason back then. You reason, I don't want to do that because I don't want to get arrested. I don't want to do that because I'm going to get karma. No. Your thinking now is for others. I'm not going to participate in this particular situation because I don't want to be what? a stumbling block for others. I don't want to give the platform for the enemy to blaspheme the name of God. So, in the believer, the mind has made a U-turn. It is no longer running away from God. It is now in harmony with God. That is what Paul calls the inner man, the converted mind. Did you get it? The converted mind, the inner man, the inner being, inwardly, is a converted. It's only applicable to whom? To those that has been born again. Paul is saying that it is in this converted mind that I want you to be strengthened with might by the Holy Spirit. Okay? You can't be strengthened in the flesh because the flesh still is sinful and belongs to the realm of the camp of Satan. But the converted minds belong to God. The inner man belongs to God and that is where the Holy Spirit is controlling the dwelling. He dwells in our spirit, but he wants us to be strengthened with might in the inner man, in the converted mind. Now, how are, how are we to be strengthened? How are we to be strengthened? I hope that the clarity of it is the Holy Spirit will clarify these things to you. Because the first time I heard of it, this beautiful uh, words that was you know, given to me, I said, wow, so that's how it happened. You hear the word, you wait on the balance, the Holy Spirit is working, you're convicted of the word, you converted, and you accept Jesus Christ in your life. And now your mind is strengthened by the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the soul of man is now under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 17. In Ephesians 3. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. What is Paul saying here? Especially the first part of the verse. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. So does that mean that Christ wasn't with the Ephesians people? The Ephesians believer? Is Paul... What is Paul saying here? Huh? 
He is praying to God that Christ may dwell in the hearts of these Ephesians believers. But the fact is, the believers already had Christ dwelling in them. What is he implying? Are they unbelievers? The answer is no. Because in his introduction to Ephesians 1, he called them faithful in Christ. Then what does he mean by this prayer that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith? The solution is found in the word dwell. See? The word dwell in English simply means, or having, having only one meaning, residing or reside. Okay? But in the language of Greek, where the New Testament was written, there are two words in the Greek in the Greek in the Greek language that can be translated into the English word dwell. Okay? They have the same root word, and the root word is keo or ki -e o Now, what are these words? The first word is that I'm gonna to share to you is called katoikio, means to dwell permanently in a place or permanently dwellers, permanent dwellers. Katoikio. The next word is paroikio, means to dwell temporarily in a place. Now, how is this to be used? How is this to be used? For example, you are traveling to Florida from where we are. And it's a very far place, about what, 18 hours, something like that? Maybe 20 if you're running, if you're running uh, according to the speed, 20, 21. So you're tired. So what do you do when you're tired along the way? You stop in a motel. To yes. stop in a motel, that's called paroikio. Okay? Temporarily. Temporarily staying there. After you reach in Florida, you get there, you stay there for a while. That's still paroikio. When you come back to New York and you go back in your house, that's called katoikio. That means you are a permanent dwellers in there. Okay? Now, it is true that Christ dwells in every born-again Christian. But the question is, is he dwelling in you permanently? Is he dwelling, the Holy Spirit dwelling with us as Jesus is? When Jesus says, I came not to do my own will, but the will of the Father for the Holy Spirit was in him dwelling permanently. So everything that Jesus does is guided by the Holy Spirit. The question is, is that the Holy Spirit is having a reign over you? Now, please remember this. It is possible, it is possible for what? For you to grieve the Holy Spirit and drive him out of you. Romans 4.25 dealt with that. Romans 4.25 dealt with that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you have been sealed unto the day of redemption. So if it says do not grieve the Holy Spirit, that means there's a possibility that you can grieve it. Okay? In Matthew 10.22, Jesus told his disciples that they would be persecuted because of him. They would be put in prison because of him. And only those whose faith endures unto the end shall be saved. What's the key word in there? Endures unto the end. Right? In Matthew 10, 22. We need to endure. That means the Holy Spirit can be grieved. In Hebrews 10, 35, in Hebrews 10, 35, it says, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. In this verse, the writers of Hebrew is telling the Jewish Christians, don't give up your confidence in Jesus Christ. Why? Because it has great recompense of reward. My brethren, you are going to be put in a hard time. Not because God likes you, God's love to look at you squirm. No. Because God wants to remove every glitters of gold of this world. He wants to clean you up. He wants to remove the things that is hanging by us. Whatever it is. The love of the world. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. He 
wants you to empty of this. The problem is, the flesh that we have is not converted and will never be converted. This flesh that we have will never be converted. In a Christian, the only one that is convicted, the only thing that is convicted is the mind. And that is where the Spirit of God dwells within us. That is where the Holy Spirit of God reign over the spirit of our soul. Then verses 38 and 39 of Hebrews 10, it says, But my righteous one will live by faith. Remember, we are not saved because of our righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ, when you receive it, it becomes yours. So the Lord says, but my righteous one will live by what? By faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. So there is a possibility here that we shrink back, but we have been written so that we would not be ignorant, that we must persevere, that we must endure. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. Have you got it? Are you persevering? Do slowly, but yet surely, not by your own strength, but in Christ. The righteousness that saves you is in Christ. Nobody can touch that because Christ is in heaven where no thief can enter. Isn't that beautiful? That what we have given to Christ, nothing can touch it. Nobody can touch it. But the faith by which that righteousness becomes yours is not in Christ. It is in you. That the devil can destroy and touch. And he will come to you in your senses. In the five senses of your soul. He will come. And he does not rest because he knows that the time for him is short. So Paul wrote to the discouraged listeners and readers, My prayer is that Christ may dwell in you, not temporarily, but permanently. Katoikio. And the only way that Christ can dwell in your hearts permanently is when you are rooted and grounded in Christ with the love of God. And he used those two words, rooted and grounded. Botany, and you know when you make buildings, botany, when you have dealing with roots that will go straight to the ground. You are so anchored in it. You are riveted. You are riveted to the love of God. Riveted to the righteousness of God. You are riveted in Christ. Now back to Ephesians 3, verse 18 and 19. This verse tells us, how is that to happen? How is that to happen? Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. <clears throat> Let me read in verse 17 first. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you be rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. God does not want you to receive only half. Paul does not want you to receive only three-fourth, one-fourth or whatever. He wants you to have the fullness of what? The fullness of God. And who is the fullness of God? Christ. Now, this is the statement that every Christian should understand. One of the biggest problems we Christian face is understanding the love of God. One reason we have difficulty understanding the love of God is the linguistic problem. We have only one word in the English for love. I love McDonald's. I love this. I love that. Everything is love. L-O-V-E. The disciples had let, you know, when they were there, they have at least four words in the Greek language that uses the word love. Now, when it comes to this love that they used, they chose a word that has no English equivalent. They chose the word agape or agapao. In the English language called love, does now to translate it into English, the English language does a disservice to this word. Agape. There are at least two major distinctions which makes human love completely contradicting God's love. 
What is it? At least to major distinction which makes human love completely contradicting to God's love. Human love is conditional. What does that mean? It depends on outward beauty. He's beautiful. He's handsome. I love them. That's what it says. It depends on goodness. Oh, they're nice to me, so I might be kind to them. We do not naturally love our enemies, don't we? We hate them. If they fall down on the street, who cares? We talk about behind their back. We only know how to love the good ones, right? Those that are good to us or our loved ones. Even that, not all, not all our family members are, is our loved ones. We do not know how to love our enemies. That is just natural within us. You know, even children, look at the faces of those and they will remember, they will run away. They're not nice to me, I run away. They try to scare me, I run away. That is human love because it is conditional. It needs arousing because it depends on beauty, on goodness, and so on. God's love is, an, is in complete contradiction. It's unconditional. What does that mean? It is uncaused. What does that mean? It doesn't depend on outward beauty. It doesn't depend on goodness. That is why the New Testament makes it clear that while we were still sinners, impotent, what did God do? God demonstrated his love towards us. You remember that Jesus said what, what Jesus said on the cross concerning the ones that were crucifying him, right? He prayed to his father for whose sake? Did he pray to the father, Lord, stop them for hating me? Stop them for hurting me? Is that what he prayed for? No. He prayed to the father for whose sake? Their sake. Father, forgive them. That is agape. Second, human love is change-able. The greatest evidence of this is the divorce rate in this country that we are in. So you know that first-time marriages, the percentage of the people get divorced is 40%. If you have divorced and then you get married the second time, it is 60% that you're going to end up divorced again. And then, if you decide to get married again the third time, likelihood of you getting divorced is 70%. But yet, when you meet the person that you marry, what do you do? I love you because I want to marry you. Right? It says that in the United States, it's every 13 seconds there is a divorce. Every 13 seconds there is a divorce. Think of that. What about in our Christian church? Well, get this number and it says minus 25 to 35%. That's the, uh, that's, that's the study that they did. Just minus it with 25 to 35%. And you get where's the, the Christian, where does the Christian people stand when it comes to divorce? <clears throat> you know, for many marriages that is founded on love, on human love, is on shaky ground. <clears throat> That's what just it is, as I showed to you in those, and, and those studies are, the latest one is 2014. Uh, 2014 or 2015. I was trying to find uh, the closest one, but I could not find. Okay. So, a man came to you, a woman come to you and says, I love you, and then you decided to get married, and then what happened? This is human love we're talking about. And then suddenly divorce happened. What, what, what happened? What happened to the love? It vanished. It changed. That is, our, that is the best thing we can do. Our love changes. Changes for bad. What happened to his love? It went south because it's changeable. Peter discovered this the hard way, you know. He told Jesus in the upper room, all the disciples may forsake you, but not I. That's what he said. I love you unconditionally and I will die for you. And he didn't try. He didn't try. Was he successful? Was Peter successful? Defending his Lord? Yeah. But when the test came in Pilate's courtyard, Jesus was denied by Peter three times. And the third time, it comes with cursing and swearing. What happened to his love? Where did it go? 
Didn't he just promise it a few hours earlier? It disappeared because human love is changeable. It's unreliable. But Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says otherwise, and it records. This is how it happened. That God loves us with an everlasting love. Ah, you see the difference? Man's love is chains able. God's love is what? Everlasting. We are told also in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, where Paul defines that agape, it says, love never fails. Have you been loved by someone that never fails? That's why when Paul was saddened because of the news that he heard about the Ephesians, he knew exactly what to do. He knew that God's love is everlasting. He knew that God's love never fails. So where did he go? What did he do? He bent down on his knees and bring his supplications to God. I may not understand everything, Lord, but I know that I am exactly where you intended me to be. <laughs> you could be in hard times. God exactly knows where you are. Aren't you more, more, than, more than the sparrow? And it tells us that there's no sparrow that falls to the ground that he did not know. He knew it. And John 13 verse 1 states that Jesus loves us to the very end. To the very end of what? To the very end of what is going on in this world. And then he is going to usher us into the new heaven and the new earth. We have a God who loves us unconditionally and whose love never stops. There is a tremendous passage where Paul is asking a question in Romans 8 verse 35. It says, Romans 8.35, he asked this question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Is this what we're going to today, brethren? Is there trouble? Is there hardship? You might not be persecuted in a way that we see in the Bible. But has been people make fun of you because of what you believe? This is Paul's question in Romans 8.35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword? And then he answered it in verse 37 and 38. It says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loves us. For I am convinced. What does that mean, convinced? Paul was given an evidence by God in Christ Jesus. And he weighed this evidence. And the evidence weighs so much that he knows that God loves him eternally, everlasting. That God loves him to the end. So that's why he can say those things. He's more than conqueror through him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither heights nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you know this love? That is in Christ Jesus? Are you persuaded? Are you convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that nothing in this earth or in heaven or in the satanic world, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God which was revealed in Jesus Christ? He has embedded you in the palm of his hands. Nothing can take you away from him. Nothing. God's love is unconditional. God's love is changeless and God's love is self-emptying. We read that earlier. Human love at its very best is motivated by self. We are egocentric by nature and this selfish nature has polluted every human act so that our love, even if sometimes it is wonderful, it is polluted with self. Everything that we do in the absence of Christ is geared towards self. It's geared toward our Family, our children, why do you love them? Why do you protect them? They're my family. But 
the love of God is self-emptying. Emptying. Jesus, we are told in 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He was rich, but he became poor that we who are poor may become rich. <laughs> Imagine that. Same book, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We are told that Jesus was made sin that we might be made righteousness in him. was made something that he was not. Jesus was willing to empty himself totally for us, for you, personally, for you. That hear this voice tonight. He emptied himself. God so loved the world that he emptied heaven for us in giving us his only begotten son. That's the kind of God we worship. And it is this love that you and I need to be rooted and grounded are you rooted and grounded in it? Is the root permeated now to the basis of where the source of water is? Now, Paul uses this in uh, the, the, the root. The rooted means botany. You know, people that study botany, they use the words botany. And architecture, you know, they dealt with being grounded. You know, roots goes down to the foundation. And it, these are necessity for every Christian if we are going to stand persecution and discouragement. And believe you me, discouragement will come and you will not see it coming. But the Lord see it before it comes. And he has prepared you through the words, through the writings, the book of Ephesians that we are studying so far. And Paul is going to continue as he has wrote it to the Ephesians, he is writing it to you and for me. Persecution and discouragement is coming. You cannot stop it. And when you are rooted and grounded in this agape love, you are filled with the fullness of God. And that is Jesus Christ. 1 John 4 verse 8 tells us, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. You know that verse? In verse 16. First John 4, 16. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. God's love is poured out towards you and me in Christ Jesus. Agape is not God's attribute. God is agape. Period. Everything about God is agape or love. Even his wrath must be understood in the concept of his love. Imagine that. The wrath of God. We must look at it in terms of agape. His judgment must be understood in the concept of his love. God is love and there will never, 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 never come a time when he will stop loving you. When you're down, and out and weary. And when you think that you are in the dark places, that it seems that you cannot get up, remember, God's love never stops. There will never a time, again, there will never a time that God will be loving you. We love you. Because God is love. Yes, you may stop loving him, but he will never stop loving you. And when you are rooted and grounded in this truth, when you comprehend with all the saints what is the width, and height, and depth, and length of this love, when you are filled with the fullness of God, you will be able to stand the pressures of this life. Yes, you're going to be sad. You're going to be tried, pushed. It seems that you are going to the bottomest pit. Always remember, God went to hell to get you out of it. To give you a new history in His Son, Jesus Christ. The secret for Christ to permanently dwell in the believer is for us to be rooted and grounded in the unconditional love of God. And to know that is to spend time with His Word, the Bible. 
to have a claim again to have a claim of the promises of god is to know his will and to know his will is to know it to know the word of god to spend time with it always remember then in verses 20 and 21 this is the benediction benediction is giving blessings to those that has listened and those that has read his word and we do this when we go to church after the pastors does a sermon you benediction or give blessings to the people it says in verse 20 now to him who is able to do what immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Now many times we pray to the Lord and we ask things. And it seems that we are not being answered. Why do you think that is? But do you see this verse? God is able to do for us more than we ask or think. That's the kind of God we worship. Why? Because God is a God of love and it is God's purpose that man perish. That is why he so loved the world that while we were still sinners, he sent his son not to condemn the world, but that the, through him, the world might be saved. When Jesus redeemed all mankind, he said, when I go to my father, I will send you another comforter. Do you know the word that Jesus used? He used the word parakletos. And that word in Greek means somebody who is by your side to comfort you, to strengthen you, to help you, to make your prayers meaningful. Do you know that? That when you pray, God is there through the Holy Spirit. He is the power of God in you so that you may not be discouraged. That you may know in whom you believe. That you may be guided into all his truth. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the work of the Comforter. And he is the one that dwells within us. You are in a bind. He is in a bind with you. The question is, have you realized that you have a Comforter? Or are you still trying to go to God by your own strength, by your own power? By your own idea. And then he continued in verse 21. It says, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him, to God, be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. The difference between the Christian God and the pagan God is this. The pagan God is up there. He will not step down on you. And then you have to give him sacrifice. And then you must do good works and that you must appease him so that you may be acceptable to him. You have to do something. Is this the kind of God that you have to do? Oh, I'm going to do something good so that God will favor me. If that is the God that you think, you worship, then you are not worshiping the God of the creation. You are worshiping another God. That is not the God that is agape. Are you trying to appease God? Are you trying to do some wonderful things so that He will hear you? You know? Are you fasting so that he will hear you of your prayer? There's nothing wrong with fasting. Fasting is good. But what, what is the purpose of it that you're doing it? Christ says that there was a situation when they went to the Mount of uh, when the chains came down and the other disciples could not help the boy that was possessed by the enemy. And Jesus says, this can only be worked with what? Fasting and prayer. Are you fasting and prayer in surrender to him? Are you fasting from sin? Or are you only fasting with food? You know? Are you fasting only with physical? Do you remember this nature? 
Yes, we must take care of it because this is what we have, but this is not, this body of ours, this flesh of ours is never going to inherit the kingdom of God. Remember that. So are you worshiping a pagan God? Are you trying to appease God? Are you trying to do some wonderful things so that he will get your, so that you can get his attention? No, the God that we worship in Christianity is a God of love. He did not ask you to be good before he redeemed you. The God of the Christian religion is a God who came down to this earth, became one of us, and by his perfect life and by his sacrificial death, he redeemed all mankind. The gospel is unconditional good news. God is not asking you to be good before he accepts you. He does not want you to do good so that he can save you. You are impotent. I am impotent. I am ungodly. That means absence of God. I am sinners and enemies of God. And he came down to redeem me because he knows that I am poor, blind, miserable, wretched, and naked. And I could not help myself. The more I do, the more I buried myself. Again, God is not asking you and me to be good before he accepts you. Salvation is a gift for sinners. Are you sinners? Remember Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 3? Children of wrath. We are saved by grace, not by works. Not by righteousness. It is true that the gospel produces a people that are excited about doing good works. Yes, there's nothing doing good works. But good works are the fruits of salvation, but never the means of salvation. This is where a lot of times there is problem because we do not know which one is which. Then what is the means of our salvation? The means of our salvation is the love of God and the holy history of Jesus Christ. These are the two basic facts of the gospel. That God so loved the world and that he redeemed us through Jesus Christ. By his perfect life, we have eternal life. By his death, we have been. What did God do by his death towards us? Reconciliation. He reconciled himself to us by the death of his son. And he gave us this ministry of reconciliation. The incarnation did not save us. It qualified Christ to be the second Adam. It qualified him to be our savior, representative, and redeemer. Have you got it, folks? Do you have this love? Do you know this God that is unchangeable and cost? If you are honest, if you look at yourself, are you lovable? Huh? When you look at yourself from head to toe, are you lovable? Or what do you see? Are you a sinner? If you are a sinner, then Christ came down to save, save you. Christ came down to redeem us because we could not redeem ourselves. My prayer is that you will know this truth and that this truth will set you free. And it will set us free. Free from works. Trying to do righteousness so that we get the favor of God. And we come to realize that He had redeemed us already. He had justified us already through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray, Father Lord, that each hearts and minds are able, Lord, to receive the words that you have spoken. I pray, Lord, that these words will be so embedded in our hearts and in our thoughts, O oh God, that when we meditate on it, Lord, we come to realize that there will never a time that God will never love us because He is agape. God is love. Thank you for the time, Lord, that you have given us. Thank you for this opportunity that we can gather together, though far from each other physically, but Lord, we have this fellowship of your words. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.